you know, I believe there is a time and a place now to start talking about this bigger collective journey where we invite all the others, all the marginalized voices, the voices of, of nature, the others to actually be part of this bigger narrative. And it's not us for to create the specific story. It's more an invitation to create it together. Greetings, future fossils. Welcome to 2018. We are now firmly footed in what I thought of growing up as the distant, insane sci-fi future. So what better place to start this year than with futurist, tech ethicist, and science fiction author Maya Zuckerman. We talk about how the future is a place for everyone and the difficulties of working as a woman futurist and the issues of the mainstream Silicon Valley narrative excluding all of these other possible voices and potential avenues to empower all human beings in a collective effort to imagine and realize a better world. That's essentially what this show is all about, and it's a delight to have Maya on board to rap about all these things with me. But before we get into the recording, I just want to take a moment to thank every one of you who has rated and reviewed the show on iTunes. It is absolutely the best way to grow the community of this audience and get more people involved and seduce higher profile guests. So thanks. If you haven't, please go up to iTunes and leave us a <laughs> gushing five star review or not. There's somebody left a one star and that was kind of cool. You know, that takes balls. Thank you. Agree stranger you got to walk the talk when you say you want all voices included right <laughs> also a huge thanks to all of the new supporters of my patreon campaign at patreon.com slash michael garfield the podcast's newest supporters kathleen brown and sophie whalen special shout out to you and the 80 some other folks who are giving the show to five even ten dollars a month to subsidize an archive of thoughtful and irreverent conversations about our place in the cosmos and our responsibility to the future of our species and our world. Ah, oh, shit, did I just say responsibility? Yes, actually, dancing with the intricate unfolding of complexity, participating in the great work of bettering the condition of all sentient beings. This is the highest form of play. And if I accomplish anything with this podcast, I hope it's that throwing yourself into service by finding that sweet spot between what you love and what you're good at and what you can get paid for and what the world needs. The phrase ikigai describes this situation. And it's my hope that I help you find your ikigai. And to that end, I put out a ton of stuff exclusive to the Patreon page. Most recently, that includes a special episode of this podcast with painter David Titterington discussing the divine and the disgusting bodies, landscapes, and religion, and how our spirituality and our sense of the sacred are natural byproducts emerging from our relationship with the land itself. Part of a new way of thinking in which we are the living organs of geology. And if that sounds like your kind of shit, then I hope you'll hop on over to Patreon and help yourself to the hours and hours and hours of free stuff I have posted over there for you as a performance of the super abundant gift economy that I firmly believe we are transitioning into in this age. And lastly, when it comes to making the future fun and turning these admittedly bizarre conversations about the co-evolution of humans and machines into a raging party slash conference. Look no further than the Body Hacking Conference this February 2nd through the 4th in Austin, Texas. I will be there moderating a panel on psychedelic and MDMA therapies as part of a big picture conversation challenging the boundaries between culture and nature, body and technology. It should be a total blast. io9 editor George Dvorsky will be at this conference and I should be having him on the show here soon in anticipation of that event. If you don't know, he's the guy that talks about dinosaurs for one of the coolest science fiction websites ever and also transhumanism and yes, very, very cool. Very exciting, bdyhax.com, go check it out. Hopefully I will see you there. 
And with that, my friends, I love you. Thank you so much for listening to this. Reach out to me anytime. Join our Facebook discussion group. I post constantly. And have a wonderful day and a happy new year. Here we go. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I am, I guess, going to be facilitating, possibly by the time people hear this, I will already have uh, moderated the, the Ecotopian Futures panel discussion that you are on at the Global Eclipse Gathering in Oregon this month. So this is sort of like a prequel mm -hmm. uh, to that conversation, and I think it will probably make the other one richer. We've been sort of talking about setting up this call for a while, and it's because, I mean, frankly, there just are not that many women working in this space that I'm aware of, that I'm personally acquainted with, and I find that in particular really fascinating, but I also find your, your views on the future worth conversation and, Thank you. and worth, worth getting into in a little bit more detail but like first why don't why don't you introduce yourself to people and explain how you how you got into futurism as a <laughs> as a vocation or a, a calling or whatever you want to call it yeah so interesting enough i'm i'm actually about to to release in a few weeks or months what i'm actually doing for work <laughs> and it's uh it's also about the future but it's more um Less like futuristic sci-fi than I'm usually am, which is good. It's very healthy for me. But I, but I'll talk about it in a month. Um, but uh, you know, I can only say say that I'm a, I somehow attained the title of VP. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but it's awesome. <laughs> Vertebrate paleontology. Exactly. No, yes. uh, uh, vice president. <laughs> but um, how I got there? Well, background is film animation, gaming. Worked in all those fields. Love science fiction, um, love specul speculative science fiction and futurism. Uh, and, and, you know, I actually was listening to uh, Along Now. The one that you posted yesterday was, uh, you know, Stuart and I forgot the guy's name. But James, I actually wanted to go. James Glick on Time Yeah, Travel. James Glick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. I never remember names. It's so bad. Um, but uh, it was just awesome and fascinating and you know disagreed with them on a bunch of stuff and agreed with them on a lot of others but it seems to be that nowadays people are more aware of the possibility of looking forward but as humans we don't have that ingrained in us but some of us do so some of us like wake up in the morning and have dreams of multiple futures and they see every moment as a splitting of a of a quantum field of what, you know, what would happen if I go there and what would happen if I go there? And all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, possibilities. So this is how I think I was born. <laughs> and then, um, years and years of just, you know, being in different industries that are very, uh, on the cutting edge, like anything from media tech to just thought ideation was, um, supporting Mitch, uh, Schultz, uh, on his Mythify projects that also kind of looked at how we're going to remix mythology, what, what's coming next. And, and being in that conversation, I also live in San Francisco, uh, you know, close to the hub of where all the future is happening. Um, and, you know, as a woman that's also been in tech, that's also was a technologist and still a technologist and working and developing now a, a huge platform as well. So, you know, I, I, I love being in tech and in the future conversation, but also is, you know, kind of pulled back a little bit to see kind of a bigger kind of bird's eye view, or actually I would say cosmic perspective of like, what is happening to humanity? So this is kind of like how I got it is a lot of just my own philosophical interest. And then just by being in the cutting edge, like, working uh, in, in an area where I get to hang with the singularity people and I get to hang with the festival people that are also cutting edge. I get to hang with everybody who's inventing the more interesting things. You know, uh, you know, I know the daughter of Kevin Kelly, you know, that that's kind of like the, the ecosystem that I'm in. And also I think where I am in my life that permits me 
Like, I mean, all of us who are talking about the future, we're the 10% of the world. We are extremely privileged and, you know, self-actualized. And now we, we have that privilege of becoming self-transcendent. And I think when you get to become that level of self-transcendence, you can actually look into the future. You actually have that that um, privilege and, and, you know, awesomeness to actually have that capability. And I think also responsibility. You mm. know, for me, it's always like, it's always like holding that tension between uh, and the fear, the responsibility, and the and the excitement about it. So this is kind of nutshell how I got to this. Mm. So yeah, you mentioned this issue of sort of futurism being a kind of like a, a manifestation of privilege, and I think mm-hmm. about that with respect to you know the. the how a study of history shows revolutions emerging from the upper middle class. You know, you get people that are, that are not so well off that they don't want change because they want to preserve their position of power, but they're, they also haven't been crushed under the boot of tyranny for so long that they can't imagine it any other way. They, they usually can kind of see a little bit of both sides and they're, they're stuck in the middle and regarded as elite by the common people and regarded as common by the elite. And so that's, that seems like a, an increasingly common, like even as the middle class is eroding in this country, mm-hmm. it seems like more and more of us are getting recruited into at least, I don't know, participating in, in these visions of the future, but like you would know, it seems like a lot of my friends living in San Francisco and the the Bay Area in general are kind of like swept up in what seems from the outside almost like a, a like a religious fervor. Like it's not it's not so much the privilege to decide to participate in the future as it is the like that we've been sold a particular vision of how things are going to go and that vision excludes a lot of you know just like any any commercial you know mm-hmm. it excludes the the cons it's only about yeah. the good stuff and so mm-hmm. I, you know this is like i don't know it's like it seems like that that world space really marginalizes a lot of people like there's there's this whole issue of the competing narratives of about the future that are coming out of like africa for example, mm-hmm. and like are just being completely ignored by the Silicon Valley mindset. I don't know. Where do you, yeah. Where do you fit in that social equation? I'm, I'm kind of, look, so a, let's start with the fact that you talked about, yeah, the middle class as the bridge walkers. So I'm a bridge for everything. Like this is how I see my purpose in the world as being this bridge. And yeah, I think there is something about that level of privilege yet not kind of disgustingly rich. And I'm going to say disgustingly rich, um, to the point that you cannot actually, you are so actually enamored by your own wealth, it becomes a disease. Uh, you know, wealth hoarding is a psychological disease. Nobody needs so much money. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but still comfortable that can actually see clearly what's happening. And then, un, you know, questioning my, where can I be uncomfortable to support more people being more comfortable? I mean, that's really what activism is, is like, saying, hey, I am comfortable, but I'm going to go out of my way to be uncomfortable so more people can be comfortable or more people can have justice, equality, equity, whatever it is. So, you know, definitely I'm more kind of one of those. And then to the, so so one thing, you know, I have a lot of friends from Singularity. I think Singularity is doing amazing work in the world. Um, And I'm going to also say that, that I believe that Singularity is a form of a new techno religion um, with a, with a prophet, Ray, uh, with, with a doc, you know, kind of a dogma that it's only about, uh, you know, that's it. That, mo- that is, this, that is the future. That is the f- one timeline that's going to work. And, the, and no other timelines, like you said, like they're, they're African timelines. I'm sure they're Australian timelines or Japanese timelines. Maybe the Japanese timelines are more like singularity, but, uh, you know, there's nobody, nobody else gets invited unless you're on that boat. And, um, you know, I just finished reading uh, Yuval Noah Harari's Homo Deus, and he talks Mm. about this this fantastic book. I mean, both his books are amazing. And he talks about that little moment that humanity 
um, has like a moment to get catch onto the train of singularity and, te- and, and the technology moving so fo- so fast before there is going to be a post-human and homo sapien. There is going to be, a, or whatever we call it, homo deus maybe, the god man. You know, it is a, a very, very problematic um, view of the future, even if it's real, because it leaves hordes of people behind. And it leaves it in... Um, in kind of a, because what I see, it's, 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 it is kind of a, it's a religion, it's excitement that people are, I mean, I'm seeing what's happening with VR and AR and AI. Um, and there's almost like a, hey, guys, where are you going? Like, why are you flying so fast in that direction without stopping? But there are, the good thing I must say is that there are people who wait, what, 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 what I would refer to as waking up to this and going, wait, 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 you know, there's a paradigm here. Um, there is a paradox here as well. And we got to actually hold both sides. There's going to be a dark side and a light side for this. And if we don't actually stop and think for a minute and put some things in place, this is going to, you know, we have a very small window to actually do that before it starts, you know, developing on a level that we're never going to be able to stop it. And, you know, you know Facebook pulling the plug on the AIs talking to each other this week or a couple of weeks ago is an indication. I mean, that's kind of scary. Um, but on the other side of it, there's uh, I've just joined a group called the IEEE. Uh, uh, that's a standard company, but the, they do a, they have this um, group of committees looking at um, uh, ethical aligned design. So the idea of putting an ethics in the design of these AIs and ASs. So from the get go, they're not thinking like um, whatever twenty eight year old white male engineer that's programming them, but they're actually bringing in. 360 degree of development and design thinking and culture into the conversation. So much more holistic versus this kind of very narrow minded development that's happening. So yeah, I'm, I'm very, you know, on one side, I'm very excited. And on the other side, I'm very weary because there's a hubris here that's really dangerous and you see it everywhere. Um, and when you call it out, people are like, oh, you can't stop technology. You can't talk about that. I'm like, Yes, you can and you should. You know, that's what ad- adults do. Kids run forward and don't take any kind of consequence. And if we want to, as a species, and I write about that in my narrative work a lot, as a species, if we want to ever become adults, mature adults, which we're not, you know, one thing mature adults do is we clean after ourselves. We, you know, we think a little bit for the future. We plan our budget. We, you know, we, we take five when we get excited and, you know, we kind of sit down. We're not, we don't have to rush about everything, but it seems that the kind of very juvenile Silicon Valley scaling bigger exponential all those all those words are just so addictive for people they can't even step back and go wait what's happening to us like how is this changing us so I think you know I'd like more of that introspection and I think it's happening I, I, I must say it is happening but not enough yet you know you brought up Kevin Kelly and he's one of these people who as far as as far as folks selling this particular vision, I think his angle on it is the most attractive. You know, I feel like he does a really good job of articulating how these accelerating technologies are not other than us, that they're an extension Mm -hmm. of who we are as human beings and that we and our technologies are together an extension of this evolutionary process like in what you know he talks about that and what technology wants that it's all it's all the universe self-organizing into ever more efficient algorithms of compression and it's just getting everything's getting smaller and faster and it has been since the beginning and so it puts the human in it, it you know back in the the center of the human narrative if mm-hmm. not in like the center of the cosmic story per se. But he also is an unabashed technological solutionist. And mm-hmm. really, you know, that that's the part of this that really, you know, if I ever have the, the good fortune to get him on the show, this is something I'm really going to explore because I feel like the, you know, almost more than anything, the real issue with this, this uh, you know, I don't know what you call it. I mean, basically like a neoliberal progressivist techno optimist mindset, if you will, is that 
the, is the conceit that all of the problems created by technology can be solved by technology instead of like you were mentioning the Institute of Ethics of Emerging Technologies. Uh, it's IEEE. the uh, Ethical Aligned Design, IEEE. Uh, mm-hmm. IEEE is the standards for standards for ele- electricity and technology, right? So yeah. they're actually, yeah. So like that, that part of it, which is the, the human component that like, that we can't simply place our faith in these ideas which have like a life of their own and take on new characteristics that there's this secondary issue, right? It's like, mm-hmm. as soon as these ideas are, are like children and you release them into the world and then they sort of, t- they have a destiny that has nothing to do with your intention. And so mm-hmm. it's like always more complicated than, mm-hmm. than that. So I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm curious to know like more than just teching, like, you know, inventing our way out of the mess that we've created how you see you know other sort of like soft technologies of human communication techniques and you know new institutional modes and like you know where else can we grow things that don't necessarily it's it's not just about like new gadgets Mm -hmm. but new ways of relating to one another that help us humanize the singularity help us ensure that the most that the that we are capable of empowering as many people as possible through this transition yeah and you know one one thing to note is that um a lot of people including you know in homo deus he talks about that the idea of consciousness is something that we're so far away from understanding um, that we might be able to get some data, information, memories, and upload them to the singularity and maybe have a feeling like we are talking to something intelligent. But consciousness is not that. It's a whole other thing. And they haven't been able to find what the hell is consciousness. Like, they don't know. And, and, and the big day is, you know, scientists that are not being paid by corporations, like the true scientists that work for ac- academia that are, you know, just really interested in, finding the big answers to the big questions. Uh, and that's what drives them. And, you know, those are the people that I really follow and listen to and kind of understand their social structure. But you know, what did you say, what you talked about is, you know, why I love festival culture so much. And I find that that is a kind of a right, a new rite of passage for humanity, the, uh, or let's not, let's not actually um, generalize a new rite of passage for what has been described the West. And now we can call it whatever we want, Europe, uh, Europe, Europe, uh, Australia, South part of South Africa and, and North America. Um, and then, you know, some places in South America that the Northern Americans and the Europeans decided to throw some festivals in because that's truly what it is. Um, and, and that is a rite of passage that was missed from uh, what has happened for, to us as humans in the last hundred years. So, you know, that is the kind of old technology that we brought back in a new 21st century, 20th and 21st century way. Uh, you know, the, I remember about 10, 12 years ago, people were like, oh, you know, uh, conferences are going to be the thing of the past. You know, people are going to just log in and then you're going to like interact that way. And if you actually look at festivals, conferences, all of these experiences are just multiplying year by year, becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. There's more of them. Everybody wants to throw a festival. Everybody wants to throw a conference. Yours truly has thrown four conferences. So, um, you know, conferences are the new festival. I know, I know. And there's like, you know, that merger in between the kind of like, um, you know, the, the conference, that's also kind of a festival and, you know, there's like, in between DJ booths and holistic foods and yoga in between talking about singularity. That was uh, Fest in, in yeah. Durham, North Carolina is, is like totally straddling yeah. that. It's beautiful. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it is happening. And, and why? Because people want to meet other people. I mean, we're talking through video and there is some connection, but it's going to be completely different if you're sitting here. And it's because there is uh, the intangible that we haven't been able to reproduce definitely not in VR right now. The intangible is the smell of the room, the, you know, the sound of the room. Okay. We can record it, but there's also the, the beauty of, uh, randomness. Uh, VR right now is not random. It's all programmed. The, you know, the beauty of 
randomness. And I actually wrote about it because of the great conversation that I had with Jay Ayoro, who's a futurist for the IEEE, and he's heading the committee that I'm going to be part of, which is about mixed reality. And, um, you know, he talks about the, you know, when you lose that friction, there's friction, you know, when too many people meet or you, when you walk down the streets, there's friction. Yeah. You got to like navigate an area. And all of a sudden when you're in that technology, I don't believe that we're there for it to actually create that randomness that is in what's happened, what has been developed here for billions of years. I don't think we're there yet. We might be there in a hundred years, thousand years, but right now, I don't think that's coming yet, but when it does, that's scary, you know, or that actually shows us that we're all completely living in a hologram and then we prove that, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I'm open to that conversation. I'm open to that reality. Then we can replay this game and, and like, it's a like Metal Gear Solid. We'll like, we'll go through and try and run, run the perfect take next time. I don't know. It's like, exactly. Like, that. I don't know. That does keep, this kind of a tangent, but. Some that's one of those things that keeps me up at night. Like, you know, when you have deja vu and you're like, okay, now how many iterations have I lived through of this exact universe? And like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm really just trying to like beat this level that has wiped my ass like a thousand times already. But at any rate, that's, um, that's probably actually, <laughs> well, actually for me, did you? I would say actually for me, what I believe deja vus are beyond when they're trying to fix the matrix, you know, when they change something. My, my interpretation is um, when you're actually either going on the right direction and you're leveling up, it kind of shows you, you know, you've just completed this. This is the next stage. You've been here before, but you've just moved to the next stage. So that could be another philosophical idea around that. Yeah, well, that whole thing, like I've been thinking about this in terms of, I'm, I'm really excited to hear that you're on the mixed reality committee. I mean, that's, that's like, that's the nut that I want to crack with you um, mm -hmm. because I'm writing some science fiction, like non-narrative kind of experimental science fiction right now about the issue of artificial intelligence and forgery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like Radiolab, I, I posted this in the Future Fossils group on Facebook, like Radiolab actually just did their latest episode on the like uh, facial reenactment and conversational synthesis. And Ooh, that's a big one. That's a yeah, big one. Yeah. yeah. And, and like this issue of, as I understand it, like this really gets to the heart of not just how we understand authentic news, like how we yeah. understand recordings, but then also, you know, we use recordings, we use all of these traces to orient ourselves in time. And it's, you know, this has really changed the way that I think about the the sort of framing of this podcast, because, you know, I hear here we are leaving these records for the future. But by the time the future is there to receive them, they're going to be buried in this like landfill of like uh, self-organized robot fake history mm -hmm. that is is basically just like manufactured facts about stuff that didn't happen in order to spoof people into achieving like a particular behavioral outcomes. And yeah. so like, it, it's going to be, you know, in another 50 years, it's like hard for me to see how we're not going to be sifting through all this stuff, trying to figure out what really happened. Like yeah. we're already at that point where we don't agree, you know, that there's like the, we, we're starting to see, this this whole thing about like climate science denial and flat earthers are yeah. like the harbingers of this this new thing that's going to become totally normal which is yeah. that we're not going to agree on the past and so this issue of deja vu being like a moment where you can kind of stand outside of time i almost wonder if our media environment is not forcing us to adapt psychologically to all of these conflicting narratives in such a way that we regard both past and future as like this bush of quantum possibilities and that we mm -hmm. don't that we sort of like lose our our grip on and concern for what is real at maybe at the very moment that it matters most like that it matters most that we that we can that we should mm -hmm. agree on things, but also 
it's sort of like the decaying platform of consensus reality requires us to like grow wings and soar into this like different kind of transcendental relationship to the possible versus the actual. That's mm-hmm. a fucking trip. I don't know where you want to go with that, but like that definitely yeah. feels. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of stuff that's coming up for me. I mean, you know, one of the things is, yeah, we can, we can sit here and philosophize about what is reality, but I, you know, one of the things in this whole kind of quote unquote post truth world is that I'm actually going to call bullshit on it and say, uh, no, if you're going to go outside and stand in front of a moving vehicle, it's probably going to hit you. That's truth. If you're going to jump off a, of a roof, you're going to hit yourself. That's truth. Um, if you're going to go to the water and the ocean and take a sip, it's going to be salty. That's truth. So I think there is bullshit narratives, but, and they're on steroids right now and they're really, really fast, but you know, they have always been bullshit narratives, <laughs> you know, it's just that now we're more aware of them and now they're also are hitting us faster. So I think what, ne- what needs to be built is this like resilience of understanding what is true in this world. Cause you can, you know, we can argue of, you know, real- we don't know what reality is. We might not be able to ever tell what, what is real is what is not, but we can actually have some, you know, we have direct experience. And there's direct experience and then there's story. So I think if we actually start removing story from direct experience uh, is where we actually can start having resilience around what's happening because it is jarring and scary and most people don't think that way. Um, Most people forget that there is a direct experience reality and then there is a manufactured narrative. Um, And that manufactured narrative is just running amok, but it has always run amok. You know, Uh, I, I come from the Middle East. It's like, it's the cradle of crazy narratives trying to fight each other about you know who owns this place and you know and I'm much it's interesting that I moved to the Americas and I so much more adhere to some of the Native American mythologies of we do not own anything we are we are guests here and when you are a guest you you take care of the land there's a stewardship there's an not an ownership but a responsibility to leave it better for the ones coming after you um so you know so i think that's kind of yeah but but there is a danger there there is totally a danger there because we are more on our devices we are more believing that this is that the reality that we're experiencing online which is its own reality it's a digital you know it's a it's our digital selves and they're real um and they can affect us big time uh but we need to actually create some resilience to actually start going wait 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 if I am superpositions to ha- to be both my physical and digital self, how do I keep resilience and and, and remembering what is a direct experience of the real world and what it is of the digital world? Like, can I actually separate? And, and also, I think uh, for me, this is this is kind of my narrative work. Work is, you know, we're we're story creating, we're story creating characters, right? This is what we do in the world. We. Uh, we walk around the world and we invent stories about every little thing that happens. Uh, you know, the mug that I'm drinking from is a story. You know, it's a story of where do I put my liquid? Um, you mm. know, and so, you know, but now I'm in the 21st century. So, you know, this mug also has a quote and it's got like, it's got Rose, uh, Tulsi Rose. And I love, you know, there's a whole narrative here. It's huge. Right. And I can continue, continue, continue. And I bought it a rainbow, blah, blah, blah. I live in San Francisco. So there's a story here, right? And that's not the true reality of every of the given moment. That's this bigger story that I'm putting to create meaning and why I have to drink a, a cup of tea. So I think for me is like, how do we start being more reflective about what's happening versus just in it all the time? And and you know, in these days, and I had like a big boom after the election, like I guess you know kind of corporate, non-corporate shaman that I am, um, that what was happening in the field was just like crazy. I mean, what was happening and the news was crazy. I could feel everybody's energy kind of just bombarded. Everybody was just completely stressing out for good reasons. Um, (laughs) And, you know, and really looking at the collapse of like, there is a collapse. There's a collapse of social structures. There's a collapse of of our ecosystems biosphere. I mean, that's happening. Like it's, you know, if people want to deny it, great, move out of our way for the people who are actually trying to do something about it. 
Um, and in the, in, in the midst of it, I was like, Jesus, I can't look at all of this amount of, of misinformation and confusion. And, you know, I agree with you. I don't know what, what is real and not, what is not real within those narratives. And then I went to a very ancient technology, uh, mindfulness practice. And I was like, okay, wow, they figured out something 2,500 years ago, you know? And they were like, yeah, when you get to that stage where all the voices are hitting you, whether it's your own internal voices or just looking at, at Facebook and getting just bombarded and, you know, and, and having bots attacking you and trolls from, from, you know, from Russia attacking you. At that moment, you just close everything and you close your eyes and you go into mindfulness. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, it, that's kind of the thing that um, oh, still surprises me about us humans that we actually, the simple tools we forget about. And then we kind of like try to complicate everything and make it so much complex. And it's actually, no, we don't need all this complexity. I don't know where we're going with it, but, you know, maybe again, stepping back a little bit and, and kind of relaxing would be very healthy, healthy for all of us. Yeah, you know, there's that that uh, like logging on to Facebook. I, I used to talk about it like going into a record store. Like I would have three <laughs> albums I wanted to buy, and then as soon as I get into the record store and it's loud and it's colorful and everything's going on, and I just forget what I was there to do. And mm -hmm. like that's that experience. Like the what you just described, like logging onto Facebook is totally like reading. You know, they talk about uh, all of the different challenges confronted by the buddha as he was meditating under the bodhi tree and mm -hmm. it's like the army of demons and all of the temptresses and like and it really is that way and and so i guess that's that is sort of the thing is like if we have to sort of retreat out of our minds in order to live in this space like if we if really we we sort of just have to abandon the the world of thought and like ego in order to inhabit a a future in which everything is moving so fast and everything is competing for our attention in that way and if that's the case then those egoic structures are now in in a in a way actually like lost to us like like you you know the the temples of this ostensible ancient global civilization that was buried by the rising seawater you know, mm -hmm. 13,000 years ago. And it's, and so we've, we like, we, we lose, you know, in, in escaping to the high ground of the primordial Buddha mind in our attempts to survive singularity acceleration mode, we lose the thread, you know, and I don't, you know, obviously mindfulness and meditation is going to take over for our everyday lives in a big way and we, you know we we see that in the corporate world and the fact that there's such a huge emphasis on corporate mindfulness these days suggests that you know it's going to be one of these things that becomes more and more mass market consumer grade you know mm -hmm. available and and desirable and like culturally relevant but like in that process what's left i guess i mean it's i almost feel i feel old fashioned arguing mm -hmm. for there being a like we're gonna lose the we're gonna lose our grip on consensus <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and like maybe consensus isn't what really matters here i don't know yeah but but it does insofar as like what you're saying with your you know the way that you resonate with the native american concerns about a you know being good ancestors and agreeing on how to care for the world that we're leaving behind and mm -hmm. if we can't you know, if like we're already in this place now where there's people in, in power and have been in power for decades that are just in rape and pillage mode because they're weirdo, like neoconservative fundamentalist types who think that the world's going to end soon anyway. So who cares? You yeah. Know? And it's just like yeah. this or, you know, this 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 issue of the time horizon, you know, if mm -hmm. if you are like preoccupied with keeping your shit together on the meditation cushion in order to just like even like navigate an ordinary day at the supermarket, you know, like going into mm -hmm. cyber Amazon space and like, or, you know, whatever, then, then we lose the width. Like we lose the time horizon. That's like necessary for us to come together. You know, it, it just becomes sort of like dodging through an asteroid field. Like we have to make all these quick determinations 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where, yeah. you, <laughs> where's, what's the, uh, yeah. what's the ethical patch for this? Well, so, so it's, I'm going to quote a movie that I've fallen in love with and, and don't laugh at me, but a lot of people are sharing the same kind of aha moments about this movie. It's a Disney film. It's called Moana and I love it. And uh, here I am, I'm coming out. It's amazing. There's a sentence in, a, in one of the songs where we tell the stories of our ancestors in a never ending chain. And most of us don't have that. We, that's where we got lost. We got lost is because we're all, I'm an immigrant, but I've been, an, you know, my family were immigrants to the place that I came from and they were immigrants before, um, where, you know, true indigenous culture that's been on a land for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, um, you know, really truly working the land is something that we have completely lost. And I think there is a, there's not, I think I know that we, we're going through a period of grief because we might be also losing what it means to be human. I think we're losing and we might be losing homo sapien and, you know, this kind of transition, the, the people are ready to trend, like ready to like drop off and go, you know, whatever homo sapiens with your meat suit and all of that. We're ready to become post humans and kind of live in the singularity and be, um, you know, uh, there's a great uh, science fiction book called Diaspora. The citizens are all, uh, yes, yeah, awesome, f- right? The Greg citizens all, such a good book. Oh, uh, such a great book. So I mean, the citizens were all software, a uh, sentient, uh, immortal software. Um, you know, but but they even had the kind of like, how do they deal with the people who are actually still sapiens? So the the still the meat suits, and there was a kind of a compassion for one of them, and the other one. Uh, Yatima had the compassion. I forgot the other guy's name. I think he was. I think he was a guy because Yatima was uh, gender non. She, she was a binary gender. She was. They, she was a Z or a V. And uh, you know, how do they deal with being compassionate to this kind of lesser being than themselves? And it's it's actually the conversation that humans have right now. You know, half of us or more than half are like. We got to take care to speak for the plants and for the trees and for the planet and the people who can't speak for themselves. And then the other side is like rape and pillage. We don't care. Um, and and it is kind of that we broke a chain of what it means to live in community, what it means to live together. And we're we're now in this like uncharted land. And that's why it feels like the Wild West because this is what happens. I mean, the Wild West is what happens when there's not a lot of women. And not a lot of structure. <laughs> and uh, and then you let guys do whatever they want and they start shooting each other. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, that's what happened in Lord of Flies as well. You got a bunch of guys. You know, it, it never ends well, does it? You know, so this is my call for diversity and for bringing in, you know, interesting thing that there are not a lot of women futurists. It just baffles me. Uh, I think because women culturally have been designated to one role one or two roles and um thus we have lost 50 percent of genius on, on, on for humanity i mean think about what would have happened if ten thousand years ago patriarchy wouldn't have like taken on such a strong powerful killing of the other sex the other sexes i would say and kind of just really keeping them at bay well where we would be yeah we might not have the iphone but we might be able to communicate without needing an iphone you know <laughs> <laughs> you know i actually believe that we would probably be so far beyond that this whole idea of having to build big cities would look like stupid to us because we're like why do we need to create so many things that are tactile where we can actually summon everything to us or we can create systems that are so much more um diverse uh, you know, and it's not that the women would take over, but I think more of a, a diverse community that's more uh, balanced. Uh, and, and again, the, there's also the question of all of these amazing technologies and where we're going and all of that. What is the true meaning and purpose of them? You know, is it to become godmen or is it to become what we are supposed to be? Is it to go to other, you know, other planets and become galactic? Uh, you know, that's a big question. Okay, so you said something a, a minute ago that, that struck a chord with me because you were talking about this thing about becoming a god man. And, yeah. you know, it's so important, I think. I, I wrote a piece a couple years ago about 
it was actually it was actually in response to Jason Silva because the guy mm-hmm. is constantly going on about how death is an abomination and we're gonna become yeah. we're gonna solve the disease of death and become immortal yeah. and be like unto gods. And I was like, look, I totally appreciate that like that kind of line only comes from a wound in somebody yeah you know exactly. and like the, exactly. he grew up in a very violent country and like saw his friends killed as a teenager and i get that and like okay so like no harm no foul on one level but on another level like dude has a huge audience of people that are just buying into this like adult adolescent immortalist line hook hook and sinker and it it really disturbs me because like if you think about the fact that the gap between an idea and a thing is getting narrower mm-hmm. and narrower all the time. Like it's getting easier to just manifest a, a thought Then it seems, mm-hmm. it seems like if we, if we continue on this path that we're going to have like artificial intelligent assistants that are just making things that we think about in order to please us as consumers. And then we're mm-hmm. going to have to be really careful about our thoughts. Again, it, it gets back to this issue of like retreating, uh, to higher ground and becoming more mindful about our desires, specifically the desire to accumulate more power in mm-hmm. our lives. And so like this, you know, the world that I see and uh, the world I see coming is a world where we're basically all sort of like not so much gods and goddesses as wizards and witches. And mm-hmm. so like historically, there is this difference between like uh, the masculine approach to magic and the feminine approach. And the masculine Mm -hmm. approach is all about power, you know, and exerting the will over nature. Whereas the feminine approach is all about finding a way to like dance with or engage these energies that are beyond you. Like it's, it's a Mm -hmm. much, it's, it seems like a much humbler and in, in some ways sort of more honest approach to a world in which, you know, oh, you're going to live forever, but you're going to have to go through minute by minute upgrades constantly in order to keep up with Moore's law. That doesn't sound like immortality to me. That sounds like constant transformation. And so we're like selling ourselves over a cliff here right yeah. now if we don't embrace and embody this other witchy kind of feminine angle. And I'm curious to know. Now, I think we've been we've been kind of going around this long enough, but you're really working as a as a mythographer. And so I'm mm-hmm. curious to know uh, more about how you see and how you articulate a myth that's actually, you know, useful, restorative, uh, healthy, sustainable as we move forward into this kind of a space. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd like, can, can I start from the beginning of, of what you were talking about and then kind of end with the mythographer and the collective journey? And, and I also want to talk a little bit about M's theory because I'm just going to write myself some notes. Yeah, um, yeah, we do. We totally do uh, actually need to talk about your book. Yeah, <laughs> totally, because, yeah. Because uh, the uh, Ministry of Mind, which is a timeline in my book, I, I just called it that because of the 1984, but it's exactly some of the uh, conversations that. I am afraid of a little bit, <laughs> quite a bit, actually, with what's coming forward. So, so one thing, um, let's start with Jason, because, you know, I, 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 I definitely, I, I think he's got a lot of really great stuff, but I am with you completely. What you just said about why he is against death is because of that fear. There's a huge wound there. Um, and this is from just talking to him um, personally. Um, and, and, yeah, and he's an amazing guy. I think he's extremely talented. But he's completely sold in the singularity, and I, I agree, it is dangerous, but he's not the only one. I mean, he's, he's talking to the singularity, he's, he's doing videos with the singularity university right now. The whole Silicon Valley is investing so much money into reversing aging, and I just watched the Silicon Valley TV show, and they did a little, like, riff of what is, like, not really an urban legend anymore, but reality of, you know, um, Peter Thiel, like, you know, injecting blood of young people, um, you know, that that's everywhere, you know, that's a myth that's everywhere here, and, you know, you can read about it, and then they showed it on the TV show, uh, you know, with, with a character that's supposed to be kind of a, uh, something between Steve Jobs, Peter Thiel, and a bunch of, and, and uh, you know, Travis from Uber. But, you know, and, and then the other thing you talked about, the wizard and witches and the, um, uh, you know, the different approaches. And I'm reading this wonderful anthropological book called The, the Shaman and the Woman's Body. 
And the interesting thing about anthropology nowadays, in the last like 15, 20 years, is that because there are more women, all of a sudden they're finding out that all of their anthropological observations and archaeological observations have been wrong because they were done through the perspective of a male uh, scientist. So, you know, yes, you know, we love our scientists, but they're still human. And, and if they don't have enough diversity and come in from a view that's much more 360, they will make mistakes. Like the biggest mistake, which to assume that all ancient healers uh, and shamans were men, were in, in fact, most of them, like three quarters of all ancient era prehistoric time um, uh, shamans were actually women or actually two-spirited, or actually something in between, you know, there's very openness into that conversation. And and here I'm actually going to, uh, you know, congratulate Jason Silva on his uh, origin uh, Origins TV show on, on National Geographic, because he depicts, or they depict, his, his production depicts a scene of prehistoric time of where, that, where he, the hero's journey comes to be, where the young hunter comes back from the hunt, and the shaman, healer, and, and leader of the tribe, or, or the, the spiritual leader of the tribe, because there's like a hunting leader of the tribe, and the spiritual leader of the tribe is a woman, and she asks him to tell the tale while she does the cave paintings. So most cave painters were women as well. So, you know, something happened in the middle, you know, and I think we're, we're starting a course correct. Uh, I hope that we're not too late, but I think something happened to our mythology in those days, because we... I don't know if we had the understanding that, you know, we did have the understanding that the story lasts when, once you paint it. Uh, and we gave it a lot of importance because that was a rite of passage. We were telling a rite of passage story and that was the hero's journey. And that's, you know, that moment where a young person becomes an adult. But, you know, it's not a full-fledged adult. It's just that first passage from, actually it's from like, from being a child to being a young adult. It's not like full-fledged adult yet. And we're missing something in the interim. There's there's something we have missed. Uh, so anyway, so we'll go back to like the hero's journey. So, you know, the hero's journey, yeah, again, I'm not Joseph Campbell. I haven't had like 50 years of my life just focused on all these bigger myths. But I do believe that there's something that was missed there big time. I think that it would only focused on the hunting story. And there was a whole conversation, a whole mythology that was missed around a bigger, a bigger story that we've lost. And it's a story of, of all the other people who are part of the tribe. And um, where, where, I, where I as like looked at these models and started saying, well, you know, all these other stories need to start coming to the fold because we're moving into a planetary society. We are already in a planetary society. And the old stories are good to a point. I mean, they're still very important, but they they stop. They stop when the community comes into place. And they also stop if it's not exactly, if the hero is a little bit different. For years, we weren't, especially in, in the American media, those other stories weren't told. In, in, in like European stories, they are told. Uh, Japanese stories, they are told. I mean, Studio Ghibli is all about the a female protagonist and yes, there is a journey, but it's a little bit different. Sometimes it is kind of a hero's journey, but it's not exactly the same, but you know, there, there has been this kind of very Judeo Christian savior modality that we've been like waiting for and using for so long. And you see it in so many other traditions where, you know, I believe there is a time and a place now to start talking about this, bigger collective journey where we invite all the others, all the marginalized voices, the voices of, of nature, the others to actually be part of this bigger narrative. And it's not us for to create the specific story. It's more an invitation to create it together. And from that, something new is going to emerge. So if we have singularity trying to say, this is what's going to be the future for everybody. And we don't even look at everybody else. I mean, this is just one thought. That's a problem. Uh, you know, as I said, Silicon Valley is just completely enamored with the idea of, of killing death. But, um, you know, the science is not behind them, even though they're pouring in billions of dollars into it. Uh, they might be able to make very rich people live better lives for a little bit longer. But we're not talking about 200 years. We're talking about 100, you know, healthier to 100, which is nice. I think that's great. But I think it's also, again, I'm bringing him. Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, because just like so fantastic. He brought in a point that just 
was so astute. So what does that mean? That means that all the rich people who go then become senators and Congress people can live to 100. So then all of a sudden you're going to have Mitch McConnell alive and kicking at 100. Do we want that? <laughs> you know, right. we're, you know, the only the only thing I'm happy about is that he's, you know, he's not that young, but he's, you know, <laughs> McCain is 80. You know, uh, you know, there's a couple of older guys. This, this is not OK. Yeah, it's not good. You know, we it's not about ageism. It's about being stuck in an ancient story and not being able to progress with the time. I mean, Bernie's 74. We want more people, you know, like Bernie and his age are amazing because they're thinking for everybody else. They're not only stuck on their own story. And Bernie definitely brings in the collective journey. And, and the collective journey is not collectivism. It's not one idea and a kind of a Borg-like mentality of thinking together as one. It's actually, and it's not a singularity. It's it's actually, I don't have a better word from uh, besides solidarity, and it's a problematic word in Europe, but uh, Poland, for instance. But it is that kind of mesh of people. It's like everybody gets to play their part and their role. Not everybody needs to be the leader. Not everybody needs to be the leadee, but everybody's appreciated for showing up. And, and the big thing is you show up. That's a collective journey. And you start seeing it in, um, in different modalities online, uh, you know, different medias. A festival is a great collective journey. All festivals, Burning Man, etc. cetera. Uh, Sense8 is a great example for it. Um, and then there's others, you know, World of Warcraft could look, be looking at some aspects of the collective journey. But um, my purest form of it is definitely the people who have done their own internal work, they've gone through their own hero's journey and then they came back with the gift of the village and then they found the other to form this bigger collective. That's kind of the simplification of what I'm trying to bring forward. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so do you want to comment? And then I want kind of want to talk a little, just a little example from my book, because I think it connects to something you said from before, but no, I'm, no, go for I'm it. happy to kind of go for it. You're on a good tear. Yeah. I'm on a good tear. Okay. So, um, you talked about both the singularity and, uh, the idea of in the future, you know, we're going to have these AIs that actually make decisions for us and actually create curate content for us. So I'm working on this project. It's a multi-platform project. And right now trying to focus it more into a, into a trilogy of books uh, called M's Theory. And it's a, the story of a young protagonist that finds out that she can, uh, that first finds out that she's, lucid, that she's dreaming and can actually lucid dream of, uh, of this ancient healer mentor from the Amazon. And then she can also time jump forward in time. And as the story unfolds, she starts look, seeing that she jumps to the same nine futures. Uh, and they're all, each one of them is kind of a different shade of gray moving between utopia and dystopia. So the idea of like a multiple timelines, multiple possibilities, and some are very dystopian and some are very utopian and some are kind of in the middle. And there's one that's like, completely in the middle. It, it basically, the singularity people can live there, but so can the permaculturist. You know, it, it really brings in the world that works for everybody. Because the singularity people are always going to be wanting to be the singularity people, and it's it's a group of people. So, you know, if they become their own thing, we need to have rights for them. We need to, ha to have a secure environment for them. And they need to have the same kind of relationship with us. Instead of aliens, we might just have singular singularians, you know, it's fine. You know, it, it's more how do we create a structure and a social capacity to hold them? It's completely okay. And there's these other timelines. And one of the darker timelines or, you know, my perspective of it being, you know, light and dark, this is definitely a shadow world, um, is a world where the one percent who's um, actually the persona of that character is called the uh, one party planet, the OPP, which is uh, based on a, <laughs> a pamphlet by the rules.org that talk about, you know, do we live in a one party planet? So I kind of personified it into a, a into a collective character and they they want to have the, in, in, in the present time, which is about 2049. So a present future of our of our main character protagonist they are trying to fight her and a group of other people of her collective i'll get into that in a second uh to basically rule their own timeline so basically you no know, right now 
if you actually look at reality, this is what we've always been fighting. My idea, my narrative is better than yours, and I'm going to fight you over it. So then my timeline can, can actually come to be uh, the, the, the Christian timeline versus the Muslim timeline, the you know, progressive timeline versus the conservative timeline. You know, that's what we're fighting on. And the OPP is trying to create their timeline, and then we go to that timeline. And then in that timeline in the future, in the year 2800, I called it right now, the timeline is called the Ministry of Mind. And it's a timeline where most of humanity actually perished in really bad climate change disasters. But the 1% prevailed and its descendant lives in, live in these big domed cities and they have this army of slaves, of human slaves, and of course AI and technology and all of that. But they see, keep, keep still, they still have some humans around and those humans have a chip in their brain that projects all their thoughts on every panel and screen around them. So when they walk, they are just bombarded by their thoughts and everybody else's thought. There, so there is no private thought. Uh, the, the people who actually rule that timeline all do not have a chip. Or if they have a chip, they can switch it on and off. Uh, they have that capability. Everybody else is enslaved. So you've got this place where... You know, if we're talking about my worst nightmare is I can't switch off the media. So Facebook is everywhere I go. And worse than that, <laughs> not only do I hear everybody else's posts, I'm posting constantly back at them and they're seeing all of mine. and It just never stops, um, you know, and I can't switch it off. I can't get away from it. So, you know, that, that's for me is like my personal hell. Um, and, and it's something that, you know, Black Mirror already kind of showed a couple of instances of that. They had that wonderful episode where the guy records everything mm. and you know, you basically play back your day to people because you've recorded everything in your retina and then you play it back to people. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of a scary, <laughs> a scary place. And unfortunately I woke up the day after the elections saying to myself, Darn, I wrote that future <laughs> and it's coming to be. And what do I do about it? <laughs> you know, because everything about this administration screams this future. It's just, it, it, it's actually very much that direction. Oh, totally. Um, I mean, you, so, you saw that, yeah. you, you saw that there was some like sketchy looking kind of pre campaign stuff going down with Mark Zuckerberg this last year yeah. where he was visiting people's houses, like totally not preparing to run for president. But you better be yeah. bet your ass that if this really becomes this thing where the nation is totally uh, like eaten f out from the inside by the parasite of, you know, the transnational corporate interests that I mean, which basically has been, you know, the fact that Trump is president yeah. indicates that. So it's like it is a symptom. Yeah, it seems almost kind of self-evident that we're going to end up with with. You know that this isn't as bad as it's going to get. Like that, it, that you know, somebody yeah. like Zuckerberg does become president, and then the the you know the United States ends up just as a sort of shell for exactly the kind of situation you're talking about. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I guess you know my my question to you it would be: you talked about timeline in in this where. It's sort of uh, everyone is given the space to be, you know, that everyone is given the, the yeah. choice. And I mean, do you see that as a realistic possibility still? Or well, like, if not, what is what is your what is your best case scenario for like 20 or 30 years from now? Yeah, well, you know, so, so my timelines are all very, very, you know, far fetched, like 2800. Right. And there's nine of them. So this kind of like attainable future is very Star Trekian. Um, and, and unfortunately, like since I started writing, it was about over two years ago to where I'm sitting right now, it used to be that a Star Trekking future was like a future that I really, truly believe could happen. And the last few years, I'm like, I'm not sure anymore, but I'd rather write it in because right now what I'm seeing, and it's, it's also the, um, the reason why I wrote nine different futures and gave them different flavors was because I've only seen dystopia and utopia. And um, and utopia is problematic just as much as dystopia. Utopia is too good, and it's too saccharine. It's too perfect. And you know, even in the Matrix, I said it didn't work. The first timeline my character jumps to is utopia, because I, you know, it's like everything is amazing. I live in this, in San Francisco. The Bay Bridge is uh, is a garden. You know, everything is renewable. 
Of course, the sea uh, level ri has risen since our time, but it's all this beautiful kind of like Venice, but like a sustainability Venice, and you can talk to trees, and it's amazing. Um, but it doesn't work for everybody. That vision of the future doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody can actually say, this is what I want. Uh, the attainable future really looks at, you know, one of the things that Gene Roddenberry did right in Star Trek is that it, he looked at the different roles of people and, and what they wanted to do. And, and, and he also, the other thing is, the Star Trek world is where everybody has basic income, everybody's taken care of, everybody's got food and a place to stay. Uh, and then everybody, everything is sustainable uh, and, and regenerative and, re and resilient, right? And then within that, you're given a choice of what you want to do. And when you're given that choice, you and, and, I, and I love uh, one of my favorite tensions is between Jean-Luc Picard and his brother. And his brother is a vinter and he still works the land and his father and his grandfather. And I think like historically they've had for you know a few hundred years. And Picard is a Starfleet officer. So, you know, they don't get money. It's more, this is my purpose. I want to become a Starfleet officer. I want to stay a venture. So, you know, working into that space where, you know, somebody wants to be a big, you know, run a big company, there is place for that kind of energy and that kind of competitiveness. And, you know, you probably would become a Starfleet officer probably in those days because, you know, or maybe there, there are other roles you can do in society, but we'll find the thing that fits you. Uh, and you're going to be happy because you were living on your purpose versus trying to compete with everybody else. Um, and there's still heroes and there's still that conversation and there's still issues. You know, not everything is solved. There's a lot of issues. Um, some of them are interplanetary and a lot of them are also earth issues between humans having different issues. Um, so, you know, that was kind of my, my inspiration for the world that works for everybody, that and Bucks, Bucks, Minster Fuller, you know, if, if we can design a world where, you know, everybody finds their place, everybody's taken care of, and the environment is taken care of, what can we create? That's the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the Bucky design challenge is about. It's the fastest, you know, uh, it's, I always forget because it's so long, but, you know, how, how do we create a world? I call it how do we create a world for all beings? You know, really, really putting in that conversation and, you know, that question and that design thinking in. Totally. I mean, it's, it seems pretty obvious with this. You mentioned earlier, you know, representing the non-human element here and like inviting the landscape and the, the non-human intelligences of the biosphere to participate in this. And as much as it concerns me that we might just be colonizing the last frontier, which is the, you know, like bringing animals onto the internet and, you know, turning the Great Barrier Reef into a smart reef with sensor webs and, you know, just, just sort of, you know, <laughs> yeah. wrapping everything in the machine. It, it is also, you know, there, I think it's, it's valuable to note that there is this this insistence in the best visions of our future that the voiceless be given a voice. You know, like George Dvorsky mm -hmm. uh, at io9 spends a lot of time talking about the ethics of what he calls animal uplift. You know, um, do, yeah. do we have an ethical responsibility to give sentience to our dogs, even though we know that that's going to increase their suffering in some measure? you know, along some axis, uh, it's, it's still like, how else, how else do we involve them? How else do we give them a say? Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing that I do take from more ancient technology, shamanism, uh, indigenous culture is that I think giving a dog a voice and a human voice, that's problematic. Learning to go down to the dog's level and listening and learning their language that's where we evolve. I think that's that's mm. the point. The point is not to try and throw our perspective on them, but to actually listen to what they want and then learning to listen to them. They have a communicate. They communicate. They just communicate differently. I, you know, that's I believe in you know living systems or a sentient a sentient planet. Uh, but it's not the same level of communication that you and I are communicating right now. It's different. So I think that I that's the kind of the 
the feminine, bring in the feminine of like pulling back and listening and, and also recognizing that the way I speak is not the way it will speak. You know, mm. I need to, I need to develop my listening. I need to evolve my listening to actually be able to listen to the trees and listen to the ground. And, and, you know, if you again, look at permaculture uh, farmers right now, uh, to people who hold ancient traditions, they actually listen to the land. They actually listen to, you know, they listen to their dreams. They listen to all these other things that we have forgotten to listen to. So I think being in the listening, uh, you know, is a much more important thing than developing the tool and technology to try to translate it to our language. Because, uh, you know, one of my favorite films of the last few years is Arrival. Mm. And uh, it talks, it's all about linguistics. It's all about assuming that when I come and talk to an animal that it will understand the way I'm communicating. And there's a wonderful scene when she breaks down context. Um, and then there's another scene where she talks about the Chinese taught them go and they're communicating through a game. And then everything is, you know, if everything is a game, then everything is a zero sum game because there's always winners and losers. If everything, if you, if you, if you uh, use a hammer, then everything has to become a nail. So if we use our form of communication, we're actually closing our mind to other ways of communicating that are not language. You know, there's plants communicate, you know, animals communicate. There's all these other levels. And I think one of the things that's happening with the internet VR and all that, we're going back, we're actually narrowing the capacity to communicate because we're moving it to text without face um we're moving it to vr without full expression because i'm sorry i've worked as an as a facial animator and i worked on facial motion capture i still haven't seen like amazing human facial animation moving that i don't have some like gut feeling of an uncanny valley in my stomach i mean it, <laughs> yeah. i have not seen it yet we might be close the video thing might work because that is actually really smart video on video, but uh, a virtual avatar, not yet. Very, very far from it. Um, so, so I think that's the thing that's also missing. And, and, you know, for instance, like the interesting thing about trolling on the internet, it's almost like when you pass somebody in the car, uh, there's mechanism in our communication that were, you know, evolved over time when we were living together so if you walk down the street and you, by mistake, you know, we walking, a person comes in front of you and you kind of by mistake hit them or something. Usually you don't even have to say anything. You have a eye connection. You usually maybe lift your hand. Maybe you'll say a sorry after that, but there's a communication to say, I didn't mean it. Uh, you don't have that in the car and you don't have it on the internet because you can't mm -hmm. see the person. So all of a sudden we have this like very weird communication. So again, we're kind of moving into this kind of technological communication, forgetting that there's so much more communication than is done with the body, with the breath, with the smell, with the eyes, um, you know, with listening, with feeling. I mean, there's, there's all that. There's actually we're losing senses and we're actually, you know, all the senses are becoming myopic, which is, no, I'm not seeing that as an evolution. I'm seeing that as a devolution. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Let's let us hope that we can continue listening to one another and and understanding. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If we're losing all of these contextual mm -hmm. clues and, and the the nonverbal communication of the body that that we don't become just uh, totally insensate. Just as we were yeah. about to grasp the opportunity to become, you know, in, in the Wachowski sense of it, sensate, you know, that it's like, yeah. what's, the, what's the point of uh, linking our minds if we have nothing to say, you know, nothing meaningful. Exactly. exactly. Well, Maya, it's been awesome. And nothing to feel. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Thank you. It's been great Thank having you. you. I, it's yeah, a long oh, time wow. coming I'm and I'm really <laughs> looking forward to this Ecotopian Futures panel, I feel like. You've given me a little hope. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a blast. Yeah, it will be. I'm looking forward to finally meeting you face to face. Because I don't think we've ever had. No, I don't think we have. Well, it's a pleasure. Where can people find your work? Find out about the ethical stuff you're doing. So I have a website: m a y a z u c k e r m a n myazuckerman dot com. There's links to everything. It's pretty full. Needs an update. 
Um, and, and there's also, I'm on Huffington Post and, uh, M's theory is just a little tab there and people can actually download the Bible, uh, that I have of it, non-religious, uh, atheist, uh, <laughs> story Bible, um, that, uh, that basically kind of gives the, the spectrum of the, of the world. Um, as I said, I'm in progressing slowly because of work and other other commitments but progressing slowly but surely on developing this as a book um and you know and you can also follow em on twitter and on facebook she's there she tweets she sometimes tweets and posts almost every day is she a bot she's my she's an avatar of mine <laughs> mm. right on yeah thank Absol you for having me this is wonderful absolutely Thanks again for listening to Future Fossils Podcast, a member of the MindPod Network, along with such excellent shows as the Synchronicity Podcast, Third Eye Drops, It's All Happening with Zach Leary, and many, many more. Go to mindpodnetwork.com to check those out. And if you'd like to support the show, give us a rating on iTunes or stop over at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Thank you. And have a most excellent eon.